Okay. That's okay. Well, good morning. Today we're going to be continuing in the book of Acts. So let's turn to chapter 20. We're going to be starting at verse 17. So let us begin with prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for this time. We can come together to study your word. We ask that your word may produce fruit in our hearts and our minds. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Paul and his companion, uh, companions have made it to Miletus, and he wanted to speak one last time to the elders of the Ephesian church since he, he uh, bypassed there. So next, uh, in verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And his farewell address here is the third Pauline discourse in the book of Acts, and it's the closest thing we find to the Pauline letters. Um, Luke, when recording this address, kept it very Pauline. Its general content recalls how in his letters Paul encouraged and he warned and he exhorted the churches. Moreover, its theological themes and vocabulary are distinctly Pauline. In his three missionary sermons and his five defenses, uh, have all been addressed to unbelievers in his audience. And this is the only speech Paul made that addresses only believers. So it makes this one unique. It can be outlined this way. The body has three parts which deal with Paul's past ministry in Ephesus, his present plans in going to Jerusalem, and the future of Paul himself and of the church at Ephesus. And then it ends with a blessing and, and further words of encouragement and exhortation that point the hearers to Paul's example and his teachings. So let's begin with verse 18. <coughs> and when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly trans testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, the first thing that Paul did was to review his past three-year ministry with these elders. <clears throat> he begins, you yourself know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. He's very emphatic here. This sets the stage that he's telling the truth and he's not embellishing it at all. He appealed to the way that he had lived among them in order to urge them to remain faithful in the future. These elders were among his earliest converts at that time, and during his three years of ministry in Ephesus, he'd either been in the city or in the area close by. Therefore, they had been able to observe his lifestyle and his teaching closely, and they, and they could testify to the truth of what he is now going to be telling them. <clears throat> he spoke of his service in three ways. He served with humility and was humble-minded. He did so with tears. There was an emotional aspect to it of his ministry. His heart was really into it. And he went through trials which came upon him from the Jews. And in spite of his trials, he did not shrink from ministry. Paul did not hold back anything that was profitable for them from Scripture. He employed public teaching and went from house to house, because in those days churches were house churches. And in verse 21, we see that salvation has the same requirement for Jews and Gentiles. And Thomas Constable puts it this way. He says, Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ is a beautiful, balanced way of expressing what is essential for justification? One must change his mind, his or her mind, Godward, and place trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So next, Paul is going to describe his present circumstances. In verse 22, And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every way, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify so solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. The phrase, and now behold, is Paul's ways of changing the topic. He is no longer reviewing his past three-year ministry to Ephesians. He's now going to speak of the present and what's happening now. He says, bound, he's bound by the Spirit. I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Notice here that the word spirit, in some translations, like the NASB, is capitalized, referring to the Holy Spirit. He's bound by the Holy Spirit. And others, like King James, New King James, is not capitalized, referring to his spirit, his human spirit. The Greek could be translated either way. He's bound by the Holy Spirit or bound in the Spirit. Now, if it's bound in the Spirit, as in the New King James, being a perfect passive, it has the metaphorical meaning of a conjugal type of bond. Where in this case, the human spirit is bound by the Holy Spirit. They're kind of married together, kind of there. This could mean that he was compelled in his spirit. He meant, basically, that he had committed himself to visiting Jerusalem since he was sure that this is what God wanted him to do. So whether he's bound in the Spirit or bound by the Spirit, it's the same thing, same things. He committed himself to go to Jerusalem, and even though he didn't know what would happen when he got there, he explains by stating, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city saying that bonds and afflictions await me. So evidently, since he's been going, uh, since he decided to, uh, to go, the Holy Spirit has been using prophets and other means to warn him to expect bonds and affliction when he gets there. Uh, we don't know exactly when this started, but possibly in Corinth or uh, as he's coming through on, uh, on his third journey here. But... Uh, he made a decision to go to Jerusalem after this trip, and the Holy Spirit started letting them know that things are not going to go well. He explains in verse 24 that he wanted to be faithful to the Lord more than he wanted to be physically safe or comfortable. <laughs> um, that was his primary concern. He didn't consider his life to be that dear to him, what was really dear to him was finishing his course. We see that he already developed the attitude that he reveals to us when we look at his letter to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 22 to 24, where it says, According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that in all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor, labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is so much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So we can see his attitude about death. He's not, he's not afraid to die. Believers who are truly following the Lord should not be afraid of death or dying. In fact, for Paul to be with Christ is very much better than to remain here on the earth. Remaining on the earth only means more service to Jesus and the brethren. And Paul was much interested in finishing what Christ has given him to do. He wanted only to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And this is more important to him than life and comfort. 
Verse 25, And now behold, I know that all of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. In verse 25, we see that Paul did not see himself surviving this trip to Jerusalem. As he stated, he didn't know what was going to happen to him there except for bonds and afflictions, but he was ready for the worst. We find out later, though, that Paul wrote twice from Rome about his plans of coming east again. We see that in Philippians chapter 2 and Philemon uh, chapter tw uh, verse 22. And we learn from his later writings, uh, his pastoral letters, that he did return to Ephesus. He also returned to two nearby places, Troas and Miletus. So he did see the elders again, although he did not realize it at this time when he was saying goodbye to them. In verse 26, he says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. This reminds me of when he was in Corinth. Uh, back in chapter 18, verse 6, he stated, But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. <clears throat> I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Paul had proclaimed the whole pro purpose of God to the Jews in the synagogues, and the ball was now in their court. Since they rejected the truth about the Lord, then their blood was on their own head. Paul shook out his garments, showing that he was no longer responsible for their decisions. Paul understood man's responsibility to believe the gospel. Their unbelief was not a result of Paul's failure to warn them. It was all on them. It's just like us today when we're witnessing to people. It's not our job to get them saved. That's between them and God. Um, if they reject our witness, next. You know, it's, uh, their blood, you know, their rejection is not on our heads. Uh, now that Paul will leave for Jerusalem, he's going to leave some instructions for the elders. Verse 28, says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And we see in verse 17 that Paul sent for the elders of the church. And he used the word, Presbyteros. Here in verse 28, he addresses these elders as bishops or overseers, episcopos. And they're also called a shepherd, so they're also called shepherds or pastors. Poimania, poimaino, I guess. <laughs> so he, we see that he's, uh, these same men are being called all these three, these three things by Paul. Uh, they're called the shepherds, so they're also called shepherds or pastors. So in the first century, elders, bishops, and pastors are the same people. They're the same office. The different titles, though, reflect different aspects of that office or different areas of their ministry. The office didn't get separated until the second century. Fruchtelbaum says bishop emphasizes <clears throat> the concept of overseeing the flock. Elder emphasizes the aspect of ruling among the flock. And the shepherd or pastor emphasizes the aspect of feeding or caring for the flock. So these men had all these jobs to do. The flock is the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The Messiah purchased the church to make her his own private possession by means of his blood. Therefore, these elders were to take heed to their responsibilities. They were answerable directly to Christ because, the God pos uh, because of the position God had given them over his church. 
It is important for church leaders to remember that the church belongs to God, not them. This helps balance the tendency to take too little or too much responsibility upon oneself. And the reason Paul is giving this charge can be found in the following warnings. Let's look at verses 29 to 31. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. So over the years since he began planning churches and discipling leadership, he knows certain things from experience. He says, I know that savage wolves are coming and they will not spare the flock. And over these years of his three missionary journeys, at certain places, he's written letters. And we've got those epistles and we can see that this is what he's been experiencing at these churches. Um, we can picture Paul reflecting on what Jesus taught in John 10, verses 12 to 15, about the responsibility of the shepherds passed on from Paul to the elders. Jesus said, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. These elders are shepherds of the church. They're not hired hands. And uh, they know the church. The church knows them. And they should be willing to lay down their lives for the sheep. Just as Jesus did, and just as Paul will. In verse 30, Paul identifies the wolves as false teachers. In verse 31, he instructs them to love the church as he did. He was always watching over the church. And when needed, he would always admonish or exhort them. He'd warn them. And he'd be doing that with tears. Because the people in those churches, they were his family. They were his children, so to speak. And, and, and as a parent who truly loves his children, when they see something happen to them, see them go astray, it's an emotional thing. Uh, they have to go get them, and sometimes that's with tears. In verse 32, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So he starts out by saying, I now command, commend you to God. And commend means to just sit before. Here's God. I'm giving you to him. Poop. Uh, Paul gives these elders to God and to God's word of grace. He expects them to be so close to God and his word of grace that they will be built up by them. God will use his word uh, to build them up. In doing this, Paul is stepping out as the middleman. He'll no longer be there to build them up. They now report directly to God and grow in him. And God will grow them up and he'll use his scripture as the instrument. Paul will later write in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And through God's grace, they will find an inheritance. The inheritance here is the perfection that will come with ultimate sanctification. The elders would receive it along with the others who are sanctified through the word of God. In other words, these elders would submit themselves to God and to his word, and they would be sanctified by it. Paul continued with an exhortation about relationship to the people of God. It was to be giving 
and not taking. In verse 33, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who are with me. And everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So Paul had set an example and he wanted his, the elders to know. And again, he uses that phrase, you yourselves know. And he described the principle of supporting himself. He says, I've not coveted. Coveting is a strong desire to secure something uh, or a, a strong longing for. And he did not covet what the people had. He didn't believe that the brethren were to be tasked with providing for his needs or for the needs of his traveling companions. And he worked hard to support himself and them. And now he's charging them to do likewise. He did not hesitate to raise money for others, and there is no reference in Acts or in the epistles as to his have, have him having actually asked for money for himself. He emphasized motives in verse 33, and his example is in verse 35. He wanted to give rather than receive, and to model that attitude so that not only the elders, but all the brethren could see how to live this, this attitude in everyday life. So the elders were to be examples to the people. They are, work, they are to work for their own living, not live off of others. Paul passed on what Jesus himself has said, is more blessed to give than to receive. And this particular quote isn't found anywhere in the gospel, so it is obviously one of several things that Jesus taught that was passed down uh, to Paul by oral tradition. And then Paul gets ready to part from them. In verse 36, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. So after Paul concluded his message, he knelt down and he prayed with them. And the elders responded in two ways. Outwardly, they wept and embraced him and kissed him. This was extremely an emotional time. And inwardly, in their hearts, they were grieving the Greek word means to be in great pain and great distress. And this is because Paul said that they would not see his face again. And this bothered them even more than his warnings about the coming threats to the church. And the third thing they did was to accompany him all the way to the ship. <clears throat> These 20 verses broken down into three sections. He had three things to talk to them about. He, his past ministry, his present plans going to Jerusalem, and the future of Paul himself and, his of, and the future of the church at Ephesus. All three sections have one thing in common. His message is the same. In the past, in the present, and in the future, Paul's main concern was the protection and edification of the brethren the pastoring of the church. Everything he did was in some way to teach and protect the church. The church is where his heart was. And after these three sections, there was the blessing that he ended with. And he still was concerned about the growth of the elders themselves so that they grow, can grow and protect the church. Makes me wonder what Paul would think of the churches in our country today, let alone the rest of the world. How are they protected and fed? Let us pray. Lord, we love, we thank you for Paul's example and pray that you lead and guide the elders of your churches in the world today, starting here with us at Tyndale. I know that you have been leading us. 
I know the three elders we have today, they love the brethren here, and they do their best under your guidance to protect and feed the flock. And I pray that the entire flock here looks at Paul's example and, and grows in grace in this crazy world that we live in today. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.